Is this the end, my beautiful friends? Are we at the start in the long decline in how much oil the world wants? Sounds like it's time for your 10 minute charge up. Let's go. We may be at the start of something big, like something the oil industry hasn't seen in 150 years, the peak in oil demand. Now, our oil needs are not going away anytime soon. We need oil for practically everything in our lives. It's the fuel for like 98% of the vehicles currently on the road, for practically every ship in the sea and every plane in the air, for paints and plastics and meds and fertilizer for our food supply. So wait, how could oil actually go away? Well, the market may be telling us something about what lies ahead. Oil prices have dipped below $60 per barrel. That's cheap, worryingly cheap for the oil industry. And at this price, it's their lowest point in five years. So we've got to ask, is this sinking price of crude indicating that we've hit or may soon hit the peak in our oil demand, a point of no return. I'm Scott McKnight. I research innovation, energy, global politics. Time to plug into the oil market. Let's go. Let's start here. The price of crude oil is the lowest it's been in five years and about 20% less than where it was last year. Now take out the global pandemic and the price per barrel is close to 10 year lows when back then big producers like Saudi Arabia tried to wash out competition with a flood of cheap crude. It didn't because as we've seen and we're seeing again, low prices often aren't enough to get producers to close up shop. More on that in a minute. Now, of course, cheap oil is good news for consumers, companies that make or move things around, and oil importing countries like China, the world's biggest oil importer, or developing countries like India that, like households, now have more money freed up to buy other stuff. Let's not kid ourselves here though. Trying to track and predict the price of a barrel is a futile exercise. The price goes up, it goes down, it goes all around, pushed by almost every factor you can imagine. Hurricanes and tsunamis and drought, war and violence and coups, oil companies spending too much or spending too little, the economy running hot or catching a cold, trade tensions and trade wars, and as we learned a few years back, infectious diseases too. And there's no shortage of transient factors prodding up or pushing down oil prices, tariffs from the Trump administration, or the macroeconomic mood, which can last a bit longer and is also affected by those tariffs. Or countries stockpiling oil like China did last year. But in any case, none of this lasts forever. Any of these factors can fade or be adjusted for, like we saw with this great reshuffling of oil supplies following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. But these low prices may be telling us something bigger this time around. Yes, it's still something of a Rorschach test. You see what you want to see. Then there's supply. U.S. frackers keep blasting their special fluids into shale rock to the point that this summer, the U.S. hit a new output record, more than 13.6 million barrels per day. And even that number, that only accounts for about 12% of global supply, just to give you an idea of how big this market is. And the frackers are pumping so much oil now so efficiently that old metrics like rig counts aren't useful proxies like they once were. And of course, there's OPEC+, Plus, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, plus a bunch of groups there have, that have joined in that together make up some 20 or so producers under Saudi Arabia and Russia who co-parent this informal organization. Altogether, they make up about 60% of global oil supplies. Now, this group of producers is now letting more crude into the market as they walk away from cuts they made in 2023. 
That boost in supplies is only further softening oil prices. A lot of internal stuff between OPEC plus countries there that we can't get into right now. Safe to say that this boosted supply is about market share or about not losing clients. By trimming their own production, OPEC plus members would be losing out and losing out again while other producers in the US and Canada and Brazil and more and more from Guyana come and fill the gap. So what you get is a textbook collective action problem. If I cut, you'll cheat and keep producing. So better to just keep pumping and white knuckling it out until prices firm up again. So what are the impacts of $60 barrels on the oil industry? It definitely means lower profits. And for some higher cost per operators, it may mean actually drilling at a loss for a while. Across the industry, it almost certainly means cutting jobs because after all, when you can't influence the price of the product you produce, you can really only manage your costs. And the quickest way to do that is to trim staff and to trim spending. The oil industry has always had a bit of that syndrome of the Japanese soldier still fighting for the emperor long after the war was over. It's the nature of a business where once the big costs are sunk, there's still value to pump even if prices are low or even unprofitable. But when everyone keeps doing that well, it keeps prices low until something gives. Something like the economy picks up again, some big disruption in an oil producing region, some producers close up shop, and those cuts finally take a real bite from supply. Okay, so back to what's pushing down oil prices and what is new here, or what may be new here, diminishing demand. More accurately, diminishing demand over an extended period of time. This is the end. So why diminishing demand? We've talked about how China has transformed the economics of green energy technologies and the world is breaking records in solar and wind installations. I'll get those links up in the description below. Okay, solar and wind power may not have a huge impact since that's not really displacing oil consumption. It definitely is doing that for coal and to an extent for natural gas. It's electric vehicles. Here we are. Electric vehicles will and are cutting into oil demand. EV purchases are now regularly over one-fifth of all new vehicle purchases year after year. That means the EV market is doubling like every four years or so. And from EVs being a feel-good, exotic sideshow, they're now doing some real numbers. More EVs mean less demand for gasoline and diesel, two products that currently account for over two-thirds of oil demand. But at the same time, those oil producers, the companies or the governments that depend on oil revenue, they're not going away. All of that capital, that unfathomable amount of money, really, sophisticated personnel, the expansive infrastructure, all of that built around finding extracting, transporting, and refining oil into a hundred products we use daily. Well, what happens to all of that? Oil companies may find themselves trapped. In the near term, they'll collectively continue to pump, and that supply will go into a softening market that will keep prices down. That is, until enough producers really cut spending or go out of business which would then bring supply in line with that diminished demand. But that demand would keep falling because more and more EVs hit the roads and possibly by then fewer and fewer airplanes and vessels on the seas are propelled by internal combustion engines. Let's not get too far ahead of ourselves though. Back to the big question. Have we hit the peak in just how much oil the world wants? Tough to say right now. It's a big question that is unfathomable for a century plus and now is really worth raising. Prices will rebound a bit anyway and may even go Vince Carter a time or two again. Especially in the years ahead as we get into some really choppy waters of trying to match investment levels with production levels with demand levels. Will we ever get a point of never needing oil? Well, 
not saying that here. There's still a whole world of stuff that crude oil turns into. Bunker fuel for vessels, jet fuel for, well, jets, things that aren't even liquids at all, like natural gas and propane, petrochemicals like ethylene, propylene, xylene, benzene, aspartame, ketamine, hello irene. Okay, not those last three, fine. So there's a future here to produce crude oil for all of that. What this current state of oil prices is telling us is a pretty grim story. A grim story about the health of the global economy, a grim story about the ability of oil companies to incorporate price signals into their production decisions, but also possibly a grim story about the long-term centrality of oil in the global economy. Or maybe depending on how you see it, that last one is a pretty hopeful story. Slowly, we are finally at the start of kicking this oil habit. Tell me what you think. I know you got thoughts on this one. Click like, subscribe. I'm Scott McKnight. You're all charged up. Yeah.